we are partnering with our good friends and uh, historian colleagues uh, across town at Blunt Mansion. And I'm a, I'm a proud uh, employee of the Knoxville History Project, but I'm also a proud board member of Blunt Mansion as well. So uh, this is kind of a double whammy for me. And we're really proud to host uh, something a little bit different this, this week uh, with Blunt Mansion. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Michael Jordan, um, who is the uh, marketing director for Blunt Mansion, and he'll tell you about what we're going to be doing tonight with Constitutional Day Lecture. Over to you, Thanks, Michael. Paul. Appreciate it. Uh, we really appreciate this opportunity to partner. We love the History Project, and it means so much to have you in town, all the things that you do to connect people with their history. Uh, Blunt Mansion is just a little bit about who we are. We are the oldest museum in Knoxville. We are centered around the home of the territorial governor, William Blunt, uh, who was appointed in 1790 by George Washington to govern the territory that became Tennessee. So we are a little historical oasis in the middle of town and also a garden oasis in the middle of downtown. Uh, our gardens have been tended by the Knoxville Garden Club since 1934. So we're a place where you can learn about the birth of Tennessee and uh, also connect with nature. It's really a special place and uh, we like to share it with people in all, all four of the seasons. And this is William Blunt uh, as he looked um, a few years after he signed the U.S. Constitution. The reason that Blunt Mansion is a National Historic Landmark and that we feel a special connection to Constitution Day is because Blunt, uh, sorry, my slides are out of order. In uh, 1787, Blunt was one of 39 men who signed the U.S. Constitution. Uh, this is obviously a, a 1940s painting. No one uh, captured the image that day, but there's Blunt pictured uh, just a couple of steps away from George Washington. And here is his name on the U.S. Constitution. So we've been doing a Constitution Day lecture for a few years now, and we've decided to highlight our Constitution connection. Last Constitution Day, we were thrilled to have uh, 40 people become new U.S. citizens on our property here at Blunt Mansion. Um, we also highlight that connection to local school children who come for field trips, and they're able to write with quill pens in the governor's office where our speaker is standing tonight. One of the most exciting things that's happened uh, Blunt Mansion in the last couple of years is a new partnership with the Lincoln Memorial University's John Duncan School of Law. Our speaker tonight, constitutional law professor Stuart Harris, who is also the host of a podcast and radio show called Your Weekly Constitutional, has been working with us to bring the Constitution to school children. And this is uh, Jen. And Stuart, you're going to have to tell me Stuart's, uh, Jen's last name. I'm blanking on that. Bolt. Jen Bolt. So Stuart and Jen and now other law students once the pandemic is over and field trips are happening again, come and actually make the Constitution interesting to first graders. It's a fascinating thing to see. We st I've watched it happen and I still don't understand how he does that magic, but uh, he's able to make first graders understand and third graders and fourth graders why we have a Constitution and why it matters. So uh, Stuart is a longtime friend of Blunt Mansion and back in January, we decided to step into dangerous territory on the eve of the impeachment trial for the president and actually explain to people what impeachment is and why it matters and uh, how it works. And that was especially poignant for us because as few folks know, William Blunt was actually the first impeached federal official. So Stewart broke it down. We had a nonpartisan event. Uh, it was covered by all three TV stations and it was our way of, look, if we're gonna be the Constitution Connection when it's easy, we have to do it when it's hard too. So we were proud that we did that. So that is who we are and who Stewart is. And uh, a quick note now from our director, David Hearns about why we have this Constitution Day lecture every year and who we've named it for. Thanks, Michael. Um, my name is David Hearns. I'm the executive director here at Blunt Mansion. I'd like to welcome you all to our, um, to our Dr. Paul H. Bergeron Constitution Day lecture. Um, I believe this is the fourth year we've done it, and we named it after Dr. Bergeron for a very specific reason. Uh, when I started in 2014, Dr. Bergeron was finishing his last term on the board. Um, and he had served as in several capacities on our board since 1980. Um, Dr. Bergeron is recognized, was recognized in his field as an excellent historian. Um, he helped to curate the Andrew Johnson papers, among other things, was a, a, a scholar of East Tennessee and Tennessee history, um, an author, and just one of the nicest people you'd ever want to meet. Um, we were very sorry um, to lose him on uh, July 4th this year. Uh, he passed away in Cincinnati, um, but I think on some way he would have appreciated passing on July 4th. I think that would have meant something to him. Um, he and his wife uh, left us a bequest to 
um, put towards our collection here at the museum and to um, redesign and redo our uh, permanent exhibit on Governor Blunt. So this is our fourth um, Bergeron Constitution Day lecture and we look forward to, um, to many more. Um, so here's to Dr. Bergeron and um, back to, um, I believe to Jack Neely, if I'm not mistaken. Thanks, David. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, um, I'm honored to be here. Uh, I knew Dr. Bergeron as well, probably not as well as you did, but he was, uh, he was an advisor on me about lots of uh, interesting subjects over the years. Um, I didn't want to uh, horn in too much. I, I, I don't. Uh, a few months ago, we, we had a, a history about the Fourth of July in Knoxville. We talked about how there might be eleven or twelve speakers at every event, uh, and uh, two hundred years ago. And uh, don't want to reenact that tonight, but uh, just wanted to say a few things. I, I, we're we're grateful for our relationship with Blunt Mansion, which is just uh, what ten or eleven blocks from where I'm sitting right now, and uh, would have done a lot of interesting things with them. But I, I've I'm really proud that I think one of the very first events that Knox Lister Project did, public events, was back in 2016, and we did, we did a reading of the Tennessee Constitution on the 220th anniversary of its signing uh, with, with music, musical accompaniment. It was kind of a jazz R&B group uh, led by Jack Renfro and his Apocalypso Quintet. It was uh, uh, something I'd like to try to do again sometime, but it was actually in the mansion. It was, it was a great thing. But... Uh, but I, uh, I and I've worked with with you and and, uh, and and Michael over the years. But I'm I'm grateful to have uh, Stuart Harris tonight. I've I've gotten to know him, not only mainly on the radio. We we met a few months ago. But I I uh, I've gotten to, to know his podcast, his radio show, which is really unique in America and in fascinating that he can keep this going all this time. It's called Your Weekly Constitutional, and it's on W O T two here in the Knoxville area. But it's also on a podcast, and I think you can hear a lot of them on online if you want to. But it's all every every week. It's about the Constitution, and not just for this area, but for the nation as a whole. And uh, it's a, it's a it's a fascinating uh, discussion. And I can't wait to hear uh, what he has to tell tell us tonight. We we actually share a hill. We both have. He works at LMU Law School, and we're we're up here just uh, not within sight. I can see it from here. Actually, we're on both on Old Gallows Hill, as I think. Uh, uh, people of William Blunt's era might have known it uh, uh, in those days uh, in the north north end of the downtown. But anyway, uh, with, without further ado and without trying to imitate those early uh, uh, banquets with, uh, with 11 or 12 speakers, uh, I want to yield the floor to uh, Mr. Stuart Harris. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks very much, Jack. It's a great honor to be here. I'm actually speaking to you from the governor's office at Blunt Mansion. My computer is sitting on top of the original desk that that governor wrote on and that no doubt featured prominently in many of the meetings held in this room and nearby when the state of Tennessee was first formed all the way back in the 1790s and even a little bit earlier. Um, today our subject is somewhat sad. It's a very serious subject. It's a very important subject. It's a subject that for many, many years did not get a lot of attention from historic sites, but which I'm happy to say uh, in the last three or four decades has come more to the front and the center as it should. Because as I often tell my students, it is impossible to understand United States history unless you understand that we were a slave republic. Slavery was central to our foundation, uh, it was central to our Constitution, it was central to Tennessee. And that's what we're gonna talk about today uh, for about 20, 25 minutes, and then Jack and I are gonna open up the floor for questions. So please do be thinking about things you'd like to talk about in conjunction with this topic. We're gonna go all the way back to 1619. 1619, as perhaps you know, was when the very first Africans arrived in Virginia. Unfortunately, they arrived in chains. Uh, they were a group of approximately 20 captives who were originally from the kingdom of Ndongo, which is in modern Angola, and who were on board a Spanish, excuse me, a Portuguese slave ship that was uh, heading to Mexico. And uh, they were captured by English privateers. Those are pirates who have a license to be pirates. And so those English privateers went out and seized uh, the slave ship uh, and they took those 20 slaves as their prize. They showed up in Hampton Roads and sold the slaves. 
And so that is the beginning of slave trade in this part of the world. Uh, and also, of course, the beginning of hundreds of years of, of enslavement in the United States. Let's pause and say that this was not the only form of coerced labor uh, that existed in what would become the United States. The other one that I'm sure you've heard of is something called indentured servitude. And that was where somebody typically from Europe, in our case, uh, from, typically from the lower classes, that is somebody who was poor and out of work and who needed, needed to, to support himself, uh, and had nothing to lose, perhaps, would sign an indenture, a document, where he promised to work for a period of up to seven years. I keep saying he, it was often women as well. Um, seven years, more or less, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, and in exchange, that person would get passage to the new world and the promise, if not the reality, the promise of property, of a reward at the end, typically real property, ground, so that those people could become farmers themselves. Um, in the event, uh, these people had very little recourse and were often abused by their masters. Um, probably the most famous example of an indentured servant is a fellow you've heard of called Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was indentured to his older brother James, who was a publisher of a newspaper. And although Franklin got some important uh, experience there that he later used to his advantage, his brother was very cruel to him and beat him and abused him. And so finally, Benjamin had enough and he got on a ship and he went down the coast to New York, decided he didn't like it there. And so walked across New Jersey until he came to Philadelphia. And you know basically the rest of that story. Why am I talking about Benjamin Franklin? Because he illustrates the problem, one of the many problems with indentured servitude, and that is that the indentured servants looked just like the people around them. So even though Franklin was technically a fugitive and could have been arrested and could have been dragged back in chains to Boston, he managed to evade that simply by blending in with the rest of the population. So that was one big problem. You wanna keep track of these indentured servants, otherwise they're gonna run away from you. Uh, meanwhile, the Africans show up and they had one huge advantage and that is that they looked different from the European settlers. So what we see over the next many decades is gradually indentured servitude dies out, whereas race-based hereditary slavery comes to the fore. Now, it's a long development. Uh, originally, some of the original Africans were allowed to be indentured servants too. I mean, that was the existing model. And some of them actually became what were called freemen uh, after that time. So there was always a small population of freed Africans um, in Virginia and elsewhere. Uh, but it, um, it gradually got tightened up, if you will, and slavery eventually became hereditary and race-based and became what we are more familiar with by the time of the Civil War. But let's not get quite there yet. Let's take a quick stop in 1676, which was coincidentally exactly 100 years before Declaration of Independence, and talk about something called Bacon's Rebellion. I'm betting that a good number of you have never heard of Bacon's Rebellion, nor had I until a few years ago for the radio show, um, I discovered a place called Bacon's Castle, which is the historic house, one of the, I think it's the oldest historic house in the United States, it celebrated its 350th anniversary a few years back. And it was, it played some role, we don't know exactly what, in a rebellion led by a fellow named Bacon. And Bacon was a lower class white, I believe he'd been an indentured servant in his youth, um, but even if he wasn't, he was from the lower working classes. And what Bacon did was make common cause with black slaves. And then they attacked the plantation class. In fact, it became rather violent uh, and culminated in the burning of the entire city of Jamestown. The, what eventually was the, the colonial capital uh, was a wooden town and they burned it to the ground with one exception. And the one exception, of course, was the tavern. And that, to me, suggests that these were very, very intelligent people. At any rate, they scared the heck out of these uh, elites, the plantation owners who fled to a nearby British ship and returned only later with British soldiers and uh, put down the rebellion. Uh, but I think it really illustrates something. It illustrates that people, the elite plantation owners, um, had another reason 
for all of the vilification of black people that they did and all of the mythology about how black people were stupid or brutal or needed our guidance. Because the only way to divide black people from poor white people and prevent them from making common cause as Nathaniel Bacon had them do is to divide those two groups, is to make the white people think that they are somehow better than the black people and therefore should not associate with them. And that was very effectively done after 1676. Um, indeed, by 1669, uh, Article 10 of the Fundamental Constitution of Carolina, which included North Carolina, stated every freeman of Carolina shall have absolute power and authority over his Negro slaves of what opinion or religion soever. Um, 1669, every freeman absolute power and authority over his Negro slaves. So it's race-based, um, it is absolute, it is uh, despotic by 1669, and it's in the constitution of what would eventually become North Carolina. Um, moving forward, meanwhile, we've got a, a moving in a whole different direction, at least for privileged white folk. In 1776, Jefferson famously penned the words, all men are created equal. Um, Less well known is that he also penned a passage condemning slavery, which was deleted from the final draft because Southern slave owners and Northern business interests who benefited from slavery, and there were many of them, there were lots of people all throughout the country who were invested and profited from slavery, um, they insisted they were not gonna sign this document uh, with that passage in it. An interesting aspect of that passage, if you're wondering how Jefferson could be such a remarkable hypocrite, and he probably is the biggest hypocrite in American history, um, because he's a slave owner and he never freed his slaves, um, how he could do that. Um, I think the actual wording of that passage is instructive. He blamed George III for slavery. He blamed George III for allowing it, for propagating it, um, and that's the attitude that Jefferson and James Madison and George Washington and a lot of plantation owners had was that this isn't our fault. We were born into this institution. Um, James Madison said, that one thing Mill Jefferson said that one of his earliest memories was being on a pillow, being carried by a slave woman. So their perspective was, what are we supposed to do about it? I mean, I can't free my slaves because then my whole economy, my entire life, my structure, my social status, everything would go away. Now that may seem like a very thin uh, rationalization right now to our modern ears, but that's the way they thought about it. And so that's a very, very interesting footnote to the history of our declaration that most people don't know about. Um, into this mix, about the middle of the 1700s, the 18th century, a fellow by the name of William Blunt is born in North Carolina. Now, why am I talking so much about North Carolina? Because at this time, there was no Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee was more or less the western frontier of North Carolina. And if you ever see a map from that era of the, the nascent United States, um, or even the colonies before that, uh, every colony that had a western frontier, so excluding most of the New England colonies, every colony with a western frontier simply claimed as far west as they reasonably thought they could, which typically meant to the Mississippi River. So everything that's now Tennessee was claimed by North Carolina. So Blunt in North Carolina is born into a family of merchants uh, and they were merchants of a, a variety of respects. One way that they were merchants was that they were slave owners. And in fact, William Blunt, as a teenager, worked as an overseer for his father. Uh, he was actively supervising and perhaps rather brutally, uh, as many overseers did, his father's slave. So he got to know this institution up close and personal, and as far as I know, uh, never said a word against it. Um, the Blunts were, how shall I put this? Uh, by modern standards, at least, they were an ethically challenged family. They used their wealth to purchase political power, and then they used their political power to attain more wealth. And so perhaps it's not a surprise that when a constitutional convention was called in 1787 in Philadelphia, that young William Blunt was sent, and he was sent um, primarily to look out for the family's interests. That's what the Blunts did. They took governmental positions and they made sure that the laws and the actual actions of the government were always to their benefit. Well, um, 
he succeeded. He did very well. Now, we, we don't know a lot about what Blunt said at the Constitution. In fact, Paul Bergeron was fond of, fond of saying that Blunt was a signer of the Constitution, but he was not a framer of the Constitution because he didn't really say much of anything. And at least Paul Bergeron thought that Blunt was just basically there making sure everything was going to work out for him and for his family. Um, one way to protect the Blunt families, to protect their interest in slaves, and let me emphasize that. The two primary sources of wealth in the United States were land and slaves. And depending on whom you speak to, the slaves in aggregate were more valuable than all the land in the United States. That's how valuable slaves were. And that was a major, major part of the Blunt family's assets. And so protecting slavery was very much consistent with what he wanted to do. So do I... I don't know that he was an author of any of the passages I'm about to mention to you, but certainly he signed the document which contained them, and so he approved of them. What did our Constitution do? Well, at the outset of this, I said we were a slave republic. Buckle your seatbelts. If you've never read the original seven articles of the Constitution, you may be only vaguely aware of some of what I'm about to say. For example, you might have heard of the so-called three-fifths clause. And you've probably heard people say, isn't it horrible the Constitution considered black people to be only worth three-fifths as much as a white person? Well, while it's right to be horrified by this clause, that's exactly backward. Uh, it was the Southerners who wanted to count black people at 100% for purposes of representation in Congress. It was Northern people who said, wait a second, you're not going to treat your slaves as people, they're not going to vote clearly, so why should they be counted for representation purposes? They bickered back and forth until they settled on a compromise of three-fifths, which as you'll note is in favor of the South and the slave owners. And this is one of the many ways in which the South dominated the national government for the, for the first four score and seven years of our existence. Uh, most of the presidents, the first several presidents, were Southern slave owners, and there was a disproportionate number of Southerners in Congress, and therefore they had, you know, an advantage in the Electoral College. The list goes on. They cut themselves a very good deal. Uh, probably they would have walked without it. Okay, so the three-fifths clause is in Article One, Section 2. Another one you probably have heard of is the um, Fugitive Slave Clause. Now, the Fugitive Slave Clause reads as follows, and you'll notice that the word slavery never appears here or, quite frankly, anywhere else in the Constitution, um, the original Constitution. And Article 4, Section 2, Clause 3, uh, reads as follows. No person held to service or labor in one state, held to service or labor, okay, that would be a slave, um, under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. Notice that they acknowledged that there were states that were free states, and specifically the Constitution said slaves do not become free when they set foot, for example, in Ohio. We often hear that the Civil War was about states' rights. Well, one way of looking at it was about the fact that northern states' rights were trampled on by the Fugitive Slave Clause, uh, both the, in, this, uh, in the document, in the Constitution, in the Compromise of 1850, which strengthened that. So you literally had a situation where if I'm in Ohio or Michigan or Pennsylvania and I think I live in a free state, well, it's not entirely free because uh, slaves who come there are going to remain slaves and the slave catchers are going to be close behind them. Uh, terrible state of affairs and something that caused friction among the northern states uh, and the southern states leading up to the Civil War. Now here's one, the last one I'll mention is in Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1. Um, you may not be aware of this one. It begins, the migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808 but a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation, not exceeding $10 for each person. Think about that. We talk about human beings as migrants. We talk about migration. Importation refers to property. And they're very specifically saying states could decide 
who was going to be imported into their states. This is important for a couple of reasons because the slave trade was considered by many to be the most horrible part of a horrible institution. I'm sure you've heard of the conditions on slave ships. I'll, it suffices to say that they were inhuman, that people were chained um, and crammed together uh, below decks. The heat was horrible much of the year, um, or the cold, and uh, people were lying in their own excrement for weeks at a time. And when some of them died, they simply rotted there. So you might be chained next to a couple of dead people and the stench must have been overwhelming. And then of course these people were brought out and cleaned up and put on auction blocks. And that witnessing that in places like Charleston, which was probably the single most uh, prominent slave importation site, um, that was something that really struck people. And so the slave trade was particularly contentious. So notice what our constitution does. It protects that slave uh, trade for a period of 20 years. To add insult to injury, here's something I have to admit I only discovered a few years ago when I was looking at a completely different part of the constitution, article five, which talks about uh, amending the constitution. And it goes through all the procedures on how we amend the constitution. And by the way, it, it's worked pretty well. We've done it 27 times uh, since the beginning of the Republic. So fine, it's, uh, we amend the Constitution, but listen to this line. Provided that no amendment, which may be made prior to the year 1808, there's your 20 years again, shall in any manner affect the first clause in the ninth section of the first article. So not only do we protect the slave trade for 20 years, we then make it impossible to amend the Constitution to change that provision. That is how thoroughly our original constitution protected slavery. And that is why, although I love this country and there's much in the, the constitution to admire, I think it's accurate to say we were a slave republic. And that was perhaps, as the title of this program references, our original sin. Okay, um, fast forwarding very briefly to 1857 and the Dred Scott decision, I'm sure you've heard of that. It's widely considered to be the worst decision in the history of the Supreme Court. Um, it began uh, when Dred Scott, a slave, uh, was taken to Illinois. And his position was, I'm now free. He filed a case in federal court against his master's executor. His master had died. Um, and Scott lived in Missouri. And Sanford, the, the executor, lived in New York. And so Dred Scott needed something called diversity subject matter jurisdiction to get into federal court. That's all boring detail, except when you realize that in order to qualify for that type of jurisdiction, Dred Scott had to be a citizen of the United States and of Missouri, of a particular state. So the Supreme Court, the case went all the way to Supreme Court and uh, in uh, a majority opinion authored by Chief Justice Taney, widely considered to be a very competent jurist, uh, the court held that there was no jurisdiction because Dred Scott was not a citizen of Missouri and he was not a citizen of Missouri because he was not a person. He was property. And people like him, or property like him, I should say, were never intended to be part of the body politic in the United States. Now, if you're a lawyer, you know that at the moment that court determined there was no subject matter jurisdiction in the federal courts, they should have stopped. That should have been the end of the Dred Scott decision. And if it had been, it would have been horrible enough. But then Tawney, exercising his immense power as the Chief Justice of the United States, decided he was going to opine on something called the Missouri Compromise, one of two major compromises that had kept the, the nation together as uh, the sectional discord grew over slavery. Um, and it basically barred slavery north of a certain latitude. Um, Tawney said, well, because of what we've just said, the Missouri Compromise is unconstitutional because the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution says you can't take a person's property without compensating him. And by taking the property of slave owners north of that line of latitude, the Missouri Compromise has violated the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution. So pause and think about that for a moment. The Constitution doesn't do anything to protect slaves. To the contrary, it goes very far to prevent any emancipation of them 
because they're property and slave owners must be compensated. This constitution was remarkably pro-slavery. And again, William Blunt was one of the people who signed off on it. Okay, let's go back to the ratification period. Uh, interesting, uh, North Carolina did not ratify uh, until 1789. Um, it was the only state actually to vote down the new constitution before it reversed itself and ultimately ratified. Um, but slavery was protected, uh, still protected in North Carolina, and so nothing really changed there after it did ratify. Um, what about the area that's now Tennessee? Well, there was a deal that was struck, and North Carolina and other states that had Western claims gave up those claims in exchange for the United States government assuming their leftover debts from the Revolutionary War, big issue back in the day. And so North Carolina basically gave what would become the Southwest Territory in 1790, uh, it gave it to the United States government. The Southwest Ordinance, in stark contrast to the Northwest Ordinance, protected slavery. Uh, in fact, the Southwest Ordinance granted, I'm quoting now, all the privileges, benefits, and advantages, close quote, of its sister legislation, the Northwest Ordinance, and instituted a similar form of territorial government, except for certain stipulations set by North Carolina when it ceded its land uh, to the national government. And the principal condition that North Carolina set before it gave its portion of the Southwest Territory to the United States was the preservation of slavery in territory. In fact, the actual words uh, in the Southwest Ordinance are provided always that no regulations made or to be made by Congress shall tend to emancipate slaves. So we're still nailing it down and making sure that whatever we do in North Carolina and eventually Tennessee, we're gonna be protecting slavery. Well, again, I'm standing in a room that featured very prominently after 1790. Um, as Tennessee moved towards statehood, that's a, a great focus of the presentations and the displays here at Blunt Mansion. And I hope that you can come and learn about that at some point. It's fascinating stuff. Um, for our purposes, I simply note that the first Tennessee Constitution of 1796, although it didn't say a lot about slavery, simply assumed it. There were references to free men who could vote or the rights of free men protected in the Tennessee Bill of Rights. So again, it was baked in to our very first state constitution. Which brings us back to Blunt Mansion. Blunt himself was a slave owner. Blunt brought any number of slaves with him from North Carolina. Uh, now the record gets a little bit fuzzy because slaves, well, it's a sad truth that when we try to do right by the history of African Americans, we're confronted with a great dearth of any kind of documentation because the normal things that would be documented in everybody else's life, on paper, uh, in court documents and court records, uh, in family Bibles, all those things, or most of those things were denied to black folk. Uh, and so we don't know exactly how many slaves Blunt had. And the only real records we do have, including some names, um, come, and this is again, hard to swallow, from bills of sale uh, or from one particular transaction when William Blunt late in life was <laughs> running from creditors, uh, he, he gave most of his property to his brother, including 27 slaves. So we know about those 27. And we also know that there are references to others over the years, but we don't know exactly how many were here. But it's a fair assumption that the, the building I'm standing in was built by slave labor. The enslaved community here built this building. It maintained this building, which was a mansion at the time. It was the most prominent house in East Tennessee, maybe the entire state for a while. Um, and it was all done by slaves. And so from his participation in the Constitutional Convention to his dying day, Blunt was immersed in slavery. He supported slavery. And that's why we call slavery, not just the nations, but Tennessee's original sin. Jack, I'm gonna throw it over to you because I think now we're gonna open the floor to questions and comments.
Yeah, yes, Stuart, I'll, I'll, I'll start off. Uh, it, it, it does, uh, when you're talking about the state constitution, which I believe was drawn up on the desk where you are, you are seated right now, is it? I think it was. Um, I'm trying not to scratch anything. I'm being very careful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there might be a scratch from Andrew Jackson or somebody there, but uh, but the uh, uh, I, I think it is plausible that that the idea of slavery was baked in by 1796, as you say, well, and that's well put. Uh, but I can't help noticing, uh, pointing out that several other state constitutions, both before and after this, very deliberately said uh, we, we, we're a slave state and emancipation will not be tolerated in this state, and that, that goes for. I think er, Kentucky's was earlier and they said something like that and they said no law will be made uh, allowing for emancipation without the consent of the owner and uh, co compensation of the owner, but also Mississippi, Alabama later on. Um, but Tennessee didn't, as you mentioned, didn't mention slavery at all except for gr briefly in a taxation issue in there. And also didn't mention white people and black people in there. It, it's, uh, it's, it talks about free men and uh, it's, it's sometimes mentioned that the Tennessee Constitution tacitly permitted the idea of, of black free men uh, voting. Yeah. I don't know how many actually did, but, but for 38 years before the second Tennessee Constitution, which was much more overt and harsher uh, sounding at least than the 1796 Constitution, in terms of banning emancipation uh, and, uh, yeah, and, and, and things like that. But uh, do you think there's any significance at all to the fact, and I don't know how much discussion there was in 1796 about, uh, about slavery in the three weeks that they met in Knoxville, uh, what 55 delegates from across the territory and hammered this out. Uh, but was this, was this just an oversight? Did they forget to mention Got, by the way, we shouldn't uh, ever allow emancipation in Tennessee. Uh, I'm not entirely or, certain. I, I mean, I'll, I'll have, to have, have to admit, I really don't know. I don't know what was on their minds. All we have is, you know, the, the record of what they what they gave us, uh, the Constitution itself, and very sparse uh, other records that I'm aware of. Um, I will speculate that at least as far as the East Tennessee people went, and I believe most people in 1796 still lived in the eastern to mid part of Tennessee and the, the settlements were a little bit sparser the further west you went. Yeah. Um, so most people were in East Tennessee and this is a very mountainous region. It's not suitable for plantations and slavery never really caught on here um, the way it did in middle and especially West Tennessee which is of course along the Mississippi River and where there was a great need for slaves. Um, so maybe it was just that people here didn't feel that strongly, at least the people who were here for the first constitutional convention in Tennessee, and um, they felt that this was enough. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, thanks. Are there other questions out there? I would, uh, this is a big, big subject, and uh, I'm sure there are lots of different points of view on it, and would love to hear what other people might have, have noticed from your presentation or any other questions about people have about early slavery and, and the U.S. Constitution. Um, well, and you yes. mentioned something about the uh, folks at Jamestown. Uh, it didn't quite register what you said. Were they treated as indentured servants because of lack of other legal bases or were those original 20 actually slaves? That's an interesting question. I don't. I can't really connect the dots directly between the original uh, 20 um, and the later slave population in nearby Jamestown. I mean, the original ship landed at Hampton Roads, which is really not that far from Jamestown. And in fact, most British settlements were very much coastal at that time. Um, I suspect, and what actually what I, I know is that the two basic laboring classes there, I guess there were three, um, there were free white people, uh, there were a very small number of free black people, but most of the laborers are going to be either slaves or indentured servants. And it was because Nathaniel Bacon, who was apparently a fairly charismatic figure, uh, was able to unite many slaves with many white people of the lower classes, that that's what really scared the bejeebers out of the plantation owners. And that's why I think that it's, it's emblematic of this era and the gradual change in slavery uh, to being race-based, hereditary, and more and more repressive. I see a, a chat question here from Courtney Shea. Any thoughts about Cherokee culture's attitudes uh, towards, towards slavery? I, I lost your chat question there. Let me 
pull it up again. Um, and were Native Americans treated any differently under the Tennessee Constitution? Oh boy, you asked me a tough one there. And in all honesty, I wasn't looking for American uh, Indians or Native Americans in the Tennessee Constitution. So I can't really answer that part of your question. Um, I can tell you that just from my general knowledge that uh, Indians were um, involved with slavery in a, in a variety of ways. One of them is that they were the people who um, harbored many runaway slaves. Uh, notably, the Seminole tribe down in Florida uh, was very much a mixed race tribe because they welcomed runaway slaves and other tribes did the same thing. I don't know specifically about the Cherokee. Um, of course, the treatment of, of natives uh, in this region was terrible and it's also part of our history. Um, something I skimmed over because uh, we're short on time was the, the so-called State of Franklin. Now, if you're from East Tennessee, you've probably heard of it. This was a first attempt to form a state out of what would become Tennessee, and it only comprised uh, the, the far northeastern parts of what is now Tennessee, and it centered on Johnson City and nearby Jonesboro, uh, and a number of people who would be very prominent when eventually Tennessee did become a state decided to sort of jump the gun. I think it was 1784, it was or thereabouts. It was before our constitution was ratified and had a procedure for, for forming new states. I mentioned the state of Franklin only because one of the main reasons these people wanted to secede from North Carolina was because they wanted to be more aggressive toward the Cherokee and other Native Americans. And they were tired of asking for help from the people um, in the East in North Carolina. And so, that attitude of let's get rid of the natives and push them off the land and violate all of our treaties, um, that's why they wanted to form East Tennessee. So the attitudes of European settlers toward the Indians were in many respects quite similar uh, to their attitudes toward black folk. Okay, um, anyone else wanna jump in or do you want me to read from the chat? Do you want to go back, Stuart, do you want to go back to um, Ethan Forward's question? Do you see that one? How prominent were abolitionists in the 19th century Tennessee? Do you see that question? I'm looking for it right now, but I think you've given me the gist of it. Um, you know, I honestly don't know about the prominence of abolitionists in East Tennessee. I'm sure there were a few. Sure. Yeah. Uh, of course, um, we mostly hear about abolitionists um, up north. We hear about the Quakers who uh, notably refused to, to support the original constitution's ratification because they called it a pact with death. Um, and they saw that it was creating a slave republic and they wanted no part of it. Of course, there were many prominent abolitionists uh, both before and after um, the, uh, the civil, excuse me, the, the revolution and the formation of the constitution. I suspect that abolitionists had a much harder time in the South, not just in the years leading up to the Civil War when they were practically hunted down, um, but all along. I mean, if you're in a place where slavery is prominent, you probably would keep your, your, uh, your, your opinions to yourself. So maybe that's one reason that I've not heard about them, or maybe I'm just ignorant of, of that part of history. There, there was a very interesting flourishing of abolitionism in, uh, in, in the Greenville, uh, Tennessee area in uh, what, 1819 or so, uh, Eli, Eli, Elijah em, uh, Elihu Embry, and uh, I've, I've heard it called the first uh, abolitionist newspaper published in Greenville, Tennessee, I mean, in, in the nation, uh, it, it was a, just a brief thing, and unfortunately, Mr. Embry, I think, died young, and, and there was someone else that took it over for a while, but but it was, uh, there was a brief flourishing, and it's kind of sad to look back at, because in the 18-teens and 20s, there was an abolitionist impulse in East Tennessee that seems to have completely evaporated by the 1850s. Uh, it, it, it was, it's hard to find outspoken abolitionists. It was kind of like saying in the, in the 1850s, it was political death, I think. It was like saying, I'm, I'm for raising taxes or something if you were in favor, in favor of abolitionism in, in the 1850s in Tennessee. But, but this early flowering uh, in the 18 teens and 20s, I think, deserves some, some uh, some some further study and, and attention. I'm 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 curious about what it was and, and why it didn't go farther. See, that's why we like having Jack along for the ride because he can fill in lots of gaps and in, in the, in the knowledge of the rest of us. So thank you for for mentioning that, Jack. Now that you mention it, I think I've heard of Embry. Uh, 
uh, but I wouldn't have been able to, to recall exactly what you just said. Uh, we have another question on the chat function. So really, is the Constitution actually a victory for those 18th century forward thinkers who hope to restrict and strangle slavery over time and only fail due to the cotton gin and due to Roger Tawney's reinterpretation of the Constitution's failure to expressly acknowledge any property in man by reading that property right into the document when none was there. Um, I don't know. Um, I will say this about that, though, that I think that all of constitutional history, um, if you want to, you can begin with the Declaration of Independence, which isn't part of the Constitution, but certainly is um, our, one of our founding documents. We set high bars. All men are created equal. Well, now we look back on that and we say, ah, except slaves, or where, what about the women? But that was a revolutionary thought in 1776. And so I think that's what we can say is good about our constitutional history, is that we were trying to move away from the despotism of, of European monarchies. And just as the very first people who declared their rights in England were the lords um, and, the, and the gentry in the Magna Carta uh, in 1215, the first people in the United States who were powerful enough to demand the protection of at least their rights uh, were people like the, the constitutional conventioneers, uh, you know, rich white men. So that we have to, you know, to avoid presentism, we have to give them their due. What they did was very good in many respects. It just took a long time for us to extend those ideas to other people. Now, was this an attempt to strangle slavery? I don't know. I don't know if anyone really thought when they ratified or wrote the Constitution of 1787 that this was gonna to lead to, to slavery dying out. I think those arguments were made later when all the debates over Western expansion uh, came in and when the, the idea was that maybe we just won't have any more slave areas. Um, and of course, the Southerners would have nothing uh, to do with that and that's why we would have to admit a slave state every time we admitted a free state. That's why we had things like the Northwest Ordinance and the Southwest Ordinance. Everybody was trying to maintain a balance between the two. Um, and Abe Lincoln himself said that in his opinion, he didn't think uh, that he had the power as president to free, uh, to stop end slavery where it was. The only hope was to stop it from spreading. Um, anyway, that was probably more than you asked for, but that's my impression. Does anyone else want to jump in? I think the question that Jacob uh, Turner Barrett asked is ties into what we do here at the museum in a really, really good way. The, basic, the basis of the question is, how do we have much needed conversations regarding race without people getting defensive? Um, essentially, I think the more honest that we can be about it um, and not couching it in euphemism and just speaking of things um, in pure historical context, you know, we have, um, we have these conversations with school children all the time not during COVID, but, you know, year to year when we have school children here. And if you can get a fourth grader to understand it, you can get most people. We have a very diverse audience, well, maybe not a racially diverse audience of visitors very much, but we definitely have uh, people from all over the country and a lot of different backgrounds that come through the museum. And I'm very proud to say that in the time that I've been here since, you know, in the last six years, there have been two people that haven't come away with the right ideas. Too. And we were able to, I was able to at least put a bug in the other, in one of the two people's ear about why their viewpoints on slavery might be a little bit wrong. So um, I think it's been, you know, at least in my experience, um, when, when you can lay things out for people in a way that is historically accurate and um, doesn't I mean, it doesn't do anything but just tell the accurate history. It, it comes across a lot better, and you know you don't have to couch it in euphemism. You don't have to couch it in um, you know hagiographical hey, looks at Washington and Jefferson and everything. I think just by being honest, being real, and um, uh, very upfront and very frank really helps. I, I, I think you're 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 completely right on that, Dave. Uh, and I will say this: whenever people start getting defensive. It's white people. I mean, of course, uh, they feel as if they're being attacked. Not one person living today had anything to do with slavery. Not one person today um, is responsible for slavery. 
What we are responsible for as American citizens is learning about slavery. And as you say, Dave, facing the facts. Yes. Because you can't, you can't understand our history or the legacy of slavery, which we still see today on the streets, um, unless you face those facts. I have to apologize. I was scrolling backward in the talk function, and I didn't realize that that question I just read about um, the construct of the Constitution, hoping slavery would die out, is actually from an old college friend of mine, Bill Bandon. How are you, you doing, Bill? Um, he said uh, that, he was, that even though the Constitution protected slavery, as we've seen, it only did so at the state level. That is, it acknowledged and protected slavery where it existed, but there was no actual positive role for the federal government in slavery and no, no statement that black people were somehow inferior or that they constituted property. It was really more about accommodating the slave power than it was joining with the slave power. And I think that's a very reasonable observation, Bill, and he attributes that to uh, one of the uh, faculty members, a prominent faculty member at our alma mater at Princeton, named Sean Wilentz. And Sean Wilentz is uh, obviously a, a very deep thinker. So maybe there's something to that. Any other questions? If it's all right, I'd like to jump in for one second. Sure. Uh, Stuart, we, when we were discussing what we would talk about tonight, we decided to stick more with legal things like this and not to go into great detail about the slaves here at Blunt Mansion. Mm -hmm. uh, we do that on our tours. And we are working on a new museum exhibit that will tell the stories of individual slaves. Just today, can everyone see the website there on screen? Just today we unveiled our brand new website. And if you go over to the history tab and scroll down to enslaved persons, we tell the story of seven of those 27 who we know by name and know some facts about their lives. So we're always, uh, we have very little documentary evidence to work with, but a, a 1993 master's thesis by historian Lisa Oakley gives us a lot of information. So I'll put this website uh, in the chat box. And if you go there, there is a link to read Lisa's actual master's thesis about the slaves of Blunt Mansion and slavery in East Tennessee in the 18th and early 19th century. So that's somewhere you can go if you want to read more about the specifics here. And it's a really good read too. It's fascinating stuff. Anybody else want to jump in? Hey Stuart, it's Paul again. Um, yeah. Can we go back to Bob Davis's question? Um, he says, looking at the 1909 newspapers, there are numerous articles on white slavery. I did not pursue the exact contents, whether it was involving prostitution or the servitude of that era. How has slavery been eliminated even after Lincoln? That's an interesting euphemism. I think that Bob is probably correct, that so-called white slavery is a way to refer to women who are being coerced, perhaps, into prostitution. Uh, there's long been a concern about that in human trafficking generally. In fact, um, there is a federal statute called the Mann Act, which contains uh, somewhat quaint language talking about tra transporting women across state lines for immoral purposes. But I think it was a, a well-intentioned act, um, just as uh, long time people have been concerned about human trafficking. Um, slavery was not abolished by the Emancipation Proclamation. It was only abolished in certain parts of the country under control of the rebels. We think it was abolished in 1865 with the 13th Amendment, but it wasn't. There were other forms of slavery or near slavery that existed. And one of them that I only learned about through one of my seminar students within the last 18 months uh, involved Asian Americans, especially Chinese, who had their own form of indentured servitude that did not end in 1865. In fact, it continued to flourish and was not actually outlawed um, until the early 20th century. In fact, only during World War II, because at that point, China was our wartime ally. And so that continued, and my student argues that variations on it continue today with human trafficking of Asian women primarily. And get this, most of it is happening in of all places in nail salons, fingernail salons, where women are brought in, work under terrible conditions with the promise that eventually they'll be set up in the business. And uh, oh, by the way, are expected to do double duty as sex workers at night. So slavery has never been completely abolished in this country. It's simply morphed into different forms. And in fact, even when you talk about African-Americans, 
uh, there's increasing discussion about the fact that Jim Crow was just a continuation of slavery by another name, especially when you talk about um, the criminalization of all kinds of uh, behavior, the very aggressive enforcement against primarily young black men who were then impressed into chain gangs, which are hired out to plantations, which led to some uh, black men being back on the same plantations where they and their families had been slaves in effectively the same conditions. So we didn't abolish slavery uh, except in name in 1865, and we're still working to live up, to live up to that promise. Hey, Jack, do you want to say anything about uh, Paulson Brownlow? Is he relevant to this topic? <laughs> well, that, now that you've challenged me, yeah, uh, <laughs> there, there's, I don't think there's any Tennessee governor who's had more effect on the U.S. Constitution <clears throat> than, than Parson Brownlow of Knoxville, who's such a paradoxical figure because he was, uh, he was a Methodist parson to begin with, and he had been, I think, part of that early abolitionist flower, flowering I was talking about, but later on became a fierce, hardcore pro-slaver in the 1850s and, and even debated the subject on a national level as a pro-slave uh, Tennessean. But then somehow uh, he, he, he still hated secession. He hated secession, he hated the Southern aristocracy, and he became a unionist because of that. And during the Civil War, I think he and Lincoln were mutual admirers. And he, he uh, during, the, uh, during the Civil War, he, uh, his paper became very popular as a, in the North as an anti-secession anti paper. Um, but during the Civil War, he went on, underwent a sea change and became a, a, a hard, just an even harder core civil rights man than he had been a pro-slaver before the war. But he became unexpectedly became governor of Tennessee at the end of the Civil War during uh, during at the, at the time of the Union occupation, and the time that the kind of the radical Republicans were taking over the state, uh, our version of the radical Republicans at least, and uh, and he pushed through the Tennessee legislature, and Tennessee was a brand new returning state, uh, formerly Confederate state, returning state uh, pushed through the Thirteenth Amendment rapidly. And the 14th Amendment even more rapidly. If you look up, the, the, Tennessee was the third state in the entire nation to pass the 14th Amendment, which guarantees equal protection under the law. And it was all due to the sometimes strong, strong arm tactic, tactics of Parson Brownlow, uh, who was a most unlikely civil rights man in his 60s at this time that you could imagine considering that 10 years earlier he had been do, doing the pro-slave thing in, in, in national debates. Uh, but if, uh, a, a really interesting figure that I don't think there's been a, a sufficient uh, book about yet. The only book about him, uh, the only proper biography of him I know of, was written by a kind of a, 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 a Confederate, uh, neo-Confederate uh, scholar back in the 30s. Uh, but he, uh, I think he, he's a, a guy that, uh, that I think is almost universally misunderstood, whether you think he's good or bad. Um, <laughs> But he's, he's a complicated and fascinating figure who lived in downtown Knoxville and lived in a frame house on, on East Cumberland Avenue. And when the Confederate Army invaded and, and, uh, and, and occupied downtown, he kept running up his U.S. flag every single day uh, and, and, and just dared them to, uh, to uh, burn his house down. They finally arrested him, but he, he, they, uh, they let him, I think he, he, he escaped somehow in late 1861 and made, went on a speaking tour of the North. Anyway, uh, he's a, a, a tough guy to talk to about. Talk about in a few minutes, and, and as I, every time I walk through Old Gray, I give a tours of Old Gray. Every time we stop at Brownlow's grave, I say, "You got some time here." Uh, it, it's a uh, he's a he's a, a a weird and fascinating figure, who I think did a lot of good in a way uh, by helping pass these key amendments to the U.S. Constitution. I, did, I don't know if you have any uh, any. any uh, background on 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 the fact that Tennessee was such a strange state and and allowed black men to vote really early as, as Paul Bergeron once told me Tennessee was the sixth state in America not in the south sixth state in America to allow black men to vote in uh, in in 18 in 1867 I guess and it was partly because of Parson Brownlow and his and his uh, and his cronies but uh, anyway, that's uh, that, that may be too big a subject for uh, for uh, uh, for for this point. But but uh, a, a fascinating era, a fascinating guy. Well, Michael, Paul, Dave, I think uh, you told me we really wanted to be sure to wrap this up by seven, and my clock tells me that the uh, 
the witching hour has come. Uh, do we have uh, any? We'll go a little longer if anyone's got any more questions, or did we did we capture everyone's comments? There's a lot of comments. If people want you know, to, there's probably to look close, at them. close to thirty more messages there. Yeah. I don't know that we really can. Well, one thing one thing I would like to say, you know, we're talking about uh, going back to one of the previous questions about whether or not the Constitution framed um, it as a way to end slavery, and I think one of the best quotes I've ever heard is that the Constitution was the forge on which the change of slavery was broken. So in order to live up to those ideals, eventually they use the mechanisms of the Constitution to end slavery and, you know, put it in the dustbin of history, as they say. So um, yeah. our founding fathers weren't perfect, but the mechanisms that they left us still work today and are just as important now as they were then to, to make the change as necessary uh, for our society to grow and change and, and always be improving. Absolutely, and I think that the so-called Civil War Amendments, or sometimes called Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, uh, the 14th, which mentioned the word equality for the first time, and the 15th, which grant, uh, granted voting rights, at least to African-American men, um, they were often called, they've often been called a second constitutional founding for us, because think about it, that's the moment at which we change from being a slave republic to a republic that actually tried to live up to the ideal of equality. And isn't it remarkable that that word appeared nowhere in the original constitution or any of the first 12 amendments? It was not until after we had a war over our constitution that we were able to use those mechanisms and change course. Um, so it is a remarkably resilient document. There's a lot that's good in it. I agree with Dave that uh, we've been on an upward trajectory, but it wasn't easy. And it still isn't easy. You know, Martin Luther King said that the, uh, the arc of, of, of moral history, uh, you know, bends toward justice. I think it does. Uh, but implicit in that is that someone's got to be pushing it. And that when you look at our history, you see that's what happened. You have people on both sides of these issues. And fortunately for us, for the most part, the good guys have won. For sure. We are so grateful to Knoxville History Project for uh helping us do this tonight. And I think I should have mentioned that Stuart Harris is a brand new board member at Blunt Mansion. I think you can all see what he brings to our organization and what a wonderful speaker he is. And, and, and thank you, Michael. And it's great, what, uh, it's, it's great that we have one house in its original location uh, from that whole era. That, that's, Blunt Mansion is literally the only structure that was part of Knoxville during these capital era, this capital era, the statehood era. Uh, and it's, we're lucky that it, it was saved by the, the skin of his teeth in 1925 and that you all take such good care of it today. But pr proud to be here. And, 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 and thanks, to, thanks to, to, to Stuart very much for a fascinating talk and I'd love to, to, to work with you again. And, and thanks to David and, uh, and Paul and Nicole and everybody else who came tonight. It's, a, it's a, been a, a stimulating evening. Uh, stay in touch with us, Knoxville History Project, look us up and we'd love to, would love to uh, keep this going. Uh, we'd love to, to start dialogues with any of you. So I appreciate it. Thanks. Same thing for us. Anybody needs anything from us, we're always glad to, to speak or to show people around and lay a little history on them. And I also want to say, uh, obviously, thank you everyone for tonight. I want to encourage everyone to get out and see our, visit our historic homes and go and do programs up there. I know pa Patrick Hollis is on tonight from Mabry Hazen. Go and visit James White Fort. Maybe you've never been for decades or years. Go out and explore these great places that really inform the history and culture of this town. And they're open now. They are, they're mo including Blunt Mansion for socially distanced tours. So you can visit safely and you certainly can see the outside areas very safely. So yes, and everyone will be wearing a mask. <laughs> Mayor Hazen is open daily as well. So if anyone wants to come visit, uh, learn about the third constitutional convention, which Joseph Mabry participated in, we'd be happy to share that. Thanks so much, Dave and Stuart and Blunt Mansion, Knoxville History Project for supporting all the historic homes. Sure. Absolutely, Thanks, historic homes in Knoxville are good friends of ours. Always. I wanted to put a quick plug in for next week. Um, Jack's going to be talking about um, the history of Market Square. It's something we all know and visited and love, mm. but uh, many of you maybe not know the history of it. Jack did a book, wrote a book uh, several years before um, the formation of the Knoxville History Project, but uh, that forms a lot of his knowledge and uh, obviously he's built on that uh, since then. So uh, that's uh, six o'clock next Thursday, back here on Zoom with KHP. All right, thanks everybody. Very good. Thanks everybody. Thanks very much. Happy Constitution Day.
Happy Constitution Day, indeed.